I began my wartime career as a pianist in the Café Novochesna. To get to the café, I had to make my way through a labyrinth of narrow alleys leading far into the ghetto. Or, for a change, I could skirt the wall instead. The ghetto walls didn't come right down to the road, all along their length. At certain intervals, there were long openings at ground level, through which water flowed from the Aryan part of the road into gutters beside the Jewish pavements. Children used these openings for smuggling. You'd see small black figures hurrying towards them on little matchstick legs, their frightened eyes glancing surreptitiously to left and right. Then small black paws hauling consignments of goods through the openings, consignments that were often larger than the smugglers themselves. Once the smuggled goods were through, the children would sling them over their shoulders stooping and staggering under the burden, veins standing out at their temples with the effort, mouths wide open and gasping for air as they scurried off like scared little rats. One day, when I was walking to work along the wall, I saw a childish smuggling operation that seemed to have reached a successful conclusion the Jewish child on the far side of the wall only needed to follow his goods back through the opening. His skinny little figure was already partly in view when suddenly he began screaming. And at the same time, I heard the hoarse bellowing of a German on the other side of the wall. I ran to the child to help him squeeze through as quickly as possible, but his hips stuck in the drain. I pulled at his little arms with all my might, while his screams became increasingly desperate and I could hear the heavy blows struck by the policeman on the other side of the wall. When I finally managed to pull the child through, he died in my arms. His spine had been shattered. The real grown-up smuggling trade was a much easier operation. It was quite safe. Bribed police guards simply turned a blind eye at the agreed times and then whole columns of carts would drive through the ghetto gate right under their noses, carrying food, expensive liquor, tobacco straight from Greece, French fancy goods and cosmetics. Playing in the Nova Chesna, I used to see all this contraband daily. The cafe was frequented only by the rich, who went there hung with gold jewellery and dripping with diamonds. To the sound of popping champagne corks, tarts with gaudy makeup offered their services to war profiteers seated at laden tables. Here, I lost two illusions. My beliefs in our general solidarity and in the musicality of the Jews. Always there was complaining about the hard times and the lack of solidarity shown by American Jews. What did they think they were doing? People here were dying, hadn't had a bite to eat. The most appalling things were happening. No one paid any attention to my music in the Novochesna. The louder I played, the louder the company eating and drinking talked. And every day my audience and I competed to see which of us could drown out the other. On one occasion, a guest even sent a waiter over to tell me to stop playing for a few moments. Because the music made it impossible for him to test the gold $20 coins he'd just acquired from a fellow guest. Then he knocked the coins on the marble surface of the table, picked them up in his fingertips, raised them to his ear, and listened hard to their ring. The only music in which he took any interest. I didn't play there for long. Mercifully, I got another job in a very different kind of cafe, the Stuker in Siena Street, where the Jewish intelligentsia came to hear me play. 
It was here I established my artistic reputation and made the many friends with whom I would pass such pleasant times and also some terrible times later. I could have really enjoyed playing in the Stuka since I made a great many friends there if it hadn't been for the thought of my walk home in the evening. It cast a shadow over me all afternoon. This was the winter of 1941. A very hard winter in the ghetto. The poor were already severely debilitated by hunger and had no protection from the cold since they couldn't possibly afford fuel. They were also infested with vermin. The clothing of people you passed in the street was infested with lice. And so were the interiors of trams and shops. Lice found their way into the folds of your newspaper, into your small change. Inevitably, an epidemic of typhus broke out. The mortality figures rose to above 5,000 people every month, and there was no way of burying those who died fast enough. It was their corpses put outside on the pavements and stripped of their clothes that made my evening journey home from the cafe so terrible. Since I was the last to leave, along with the cafe manager, after the daily accounts had been made up and I'd been paid my wages, the streets were already dark and empty. I'd switch on my torch and keep a lookout for corpses so as not to fall over them. The cold January wind blew in my face, rustling the paper in which the dead were wrapped, lifting it to expose faces with teeth bared and eyes staring into nothing. I was not as familiar with the dead as I would later become. I hurried down the streets in fear and disgust, trying to get home as quickly as possible. Mother would be waiting for me with a bowl of spirits and a pair of pincers. She always tried to care for us as best she could and wouldn't let me through the hall and into the flat until she had conscientiously removed the lice from my hat, coat and suit with the pincers and drowned them in spirits. That spring, I made a new friend, Roman Kramstick. And often, I didn't go straight home from playing at the cafe, but to his flat on Electoralna Street. It was good to sit up there, drinking black coffee and talking. Before darkness fell, we'd go out onto the balcony to get a breath of air. It was purer up there than in the dusty, stifling streets. Curfew was approaching. People had gone inside, started closing the doors. The sinking spring sun cast a pink glow over the zinc rooftops. Even here, in the quarter of the damned. This was the hour of the children and the mad. 
Up on our balcony, Roman and I would already be looking down Electoralna Street for the lady with feathers, as we called her. Her appearance was unusual. Her cheeks were brightly rouged, and her eyebrows had been drawn in from temple to temple with a cold pencil. She wore an old fringed green velvet curtain over her ragged black dress and a huge mauve ostrich feather rose straight into the air from her straw hat, swaying gently in time with her rapid, unsteady steps. As she walked, she kept stopping passers-by with a polite smile and asking after her husband, murdered by the Germans before her eyes. Excuse me. Have you by any chance seen Isaac Sherman? A tall, handsome man with a little grey beard? No? Her face would distort painfully for a moment and then immediately soften into a courteous, if artificial, smile. Oh, do forgive me, she'd say, and walk on, shaking her head, half sorry to have taken up someone's time, half amazed he hadn't known her husband, Isaac. Such a handsome and delightful man. And there was a man called Rubinstein, also on Electoralna Street, always at this same hour of the day, all ragged and dishevelled, his clothes fluttering in all directions. Rubinstein brandished a stick, hopped and jumped, humming and murmuring to himself. He was very popular. You could tell he was coming when you heard his inevitable cry of, keep your pecker up, boys. One of his specialities was to approach the German guards, hopping about and making faces and making people laugh, and then to call them names. You scallywags! You bandits! You thieving bunch of... The Germans found this hilarious. After all, one couldn't take such a madman seriously. I wasn't so sure as the Germans about that. And to this day, I don't know if Rubinstein was really one of the many who'd lost their minds because of the torments they suffered, or was simply playing the fool to escape death. Not that he succeeded. The mad took no notice of curfew time. It meant nothing to them, or to the children, either. They emerged from the basements, alleys and doorways where they slept, spurred on by the hope that they might yet arouse pity in human hearts at this last hour of the day. The more musical of them sang. Others tried appealing to people's consciences, pleading with them. We're so very, very hungry. We haven't eaten anything for ages. Give us a little bit of bread. Or if you don't have any bread, then a potato or an onion, just to keep us alive till morning. But hardly anyone had that onion. And if he did, he couldn't find it in his heart to give it away. For the war had turned his heart to stone. <laughs>